Welcome to On The Money Line, a podcast by MMA Play 365. I'm Newsom, and I'm here to give you the breakdowns and predictions for this weekend's event at UFC Vegas 60, which is headlined by Corey Sandhagen versus Yadong Song. But as always, just before we get into those breakdowns, we will have a Bayes AI recap from the UFC prediction software from last weekend at UFC 279, which also features the biggest underdog that Bayes AI has ever favored and accurately predicted to win. So make sure you check that out. It's absolutely insane. I can't wait to talk about it and break that fight down there as well. And also, just before we get into those breakdowns, just a quick insight into UFC Vegas 60 and the plays that we have in the MMA Play 365 betting hub. For this event, we have already in the hub at the time of recording five recommended bets that have got all extensive breakdowns in every single fight, talking about each fighter, strengths, weaknesses, and paths to victory as well for both fighters. And then, you know, in the final section, putting everything together, how the fight's going to play out, how the fighters match against each other and where each fighter should have, again, stylistic advantages, solid paths to victory. And that's just one side of the betting hub. We have a fun gamblers section that have got pre-made parlays, parlay options. There's also my official bets inside that hub as well. So where my physical money is going in the fight. And then, of course, we've got, the Bayes AI predictions included in that same hub. So there's so much content in there and the different options that we've got is a next event subscription at $5.99 or you can pay monthly at $9.99. That can be canceled at any time for free. And we've also got an annual option at $99.99. And considering how many UFC events there are within a year and every month alone, you know, there's a ton of value in there and that's the sort of value that's the sort of betting advice that is going to be inside the hub and the value that you're getting for the money you're spending as well so again just go onto the mma play 365 website if you're interested check it out drop us a message if you need to if you've got any questions but i just thought i would just give a little insight into ufc vegas 60 because for the five fights alone the breakdowns the work that goes into every single breakdown from myself in my opinion is very extensive and it does go into a lot of detail to explain why each bet is recommended so yeah check that out and without further ado because that's why you're all here we're going to start by breaking this card down and like i've said in the main event headlining we've got Corey Sandhagen versus Yudong Song and this is a really good fight and it's actually two fighters that I like a lot I've made a decent amount of money off both fighters during the UFC tenures as well so I think that it's the right fight for both fighters right now, but I can't help thinking that stylistically this is going to be much tougher for Yudong Song than it is for Corey Sandhagen. Now, Yudong Song's got that forward pressure, aggressive style where he's durable, he'll eat shots, he'll come forward, and more importantly, he'll land his own hard shots as well. And that's great against a lot of fighters because he can be a little overwhelming especially with his movement i've always said this even from his ufc debut watching tape outside the ufc the way he slides in and out of range is just beautiful and like i said that's going to cause a lot of fighters problems however with Corey sandhagen he's going to be a little bit taller a little bit longer he's not going to have to deal with a fighter that's necessarily going to go out there and take him down and i'm not saying that song can't take him down i'm just saying it's unlikely and Sandhagen's going to get a fight where he is going to have to absorb pressure. He is going to have to potentially weather some storms throughout the fight, but it's not something that Sandhagen's not used to. You know, you look at that fight with John Lineker that he won, and John Lineker is pretty much how you don't song fights, but more intensity, more pressure, more power, more knockouts. And the fact that you don't, uh, sorry, the fact that Corey Sandhagen has already dealt with a John Lineker previously in his career when he wasn't as developed as he is right now, tells me that he's going to be able to deal with that forward pressure and aggression from Yudong Song. And I feel like Corey Sandhagen's movement's going to be a little bit slicker laterally and also getting out of bad positions once Yudong Song's forcing him back against the cage. I feel like Corey Sandhagen's volume's going to be a little bit better. I think his variety and his strikes is a little bit more vast as well. So I feel that there's a lot in the favour in the favour of Corey Sandhagen here. I think Yudong Song is definitely going to have his moments, but like I say, styles make fights. You know, I could potentially see Yudong Song maybe going further into the division, further up the ladder, potentially closer to a title shot than Corey Sandhagen. I think his ceiling's a little bit higher, but as I've just said. 
styles make fights, that's always the case. And I feel that Corey Sandhagen's style is going to pose some difficulties for Yudong Song. So for that reason, I'm picking Corey Sandhagen to win this fight. And in the next fight in the co-main event, we did have a good one, but unfortunately it's fell through. We did have Sadiq Youssef versus Giga Chikadze. And like I say, unfortunately that fight isn't going to go through. Giga Chikadze has had to withdraw, so the fight's cancelled. At the moment of recording this, I do it early Monday morning, UK time. So there isn't an opponent for Sadiq Youssef. The UFC, I hear, are actively looking for an opponent. But the thing is, because he was fighting Giga, Giga Chikadze, it's not going to be as easy to find that replacement as it would be if it was a fighter lower down in the rankings because normally a UFC debut, someone from Vegas or closer, or sorry, a little bit further away would probably jump in, but they're not gonna put Sadiq Yusuf in with a debut guy. They're gonna have to find a, a real solid opponent for Sadiq Yusuf. I think they probably will find one. They normally get what they want, the UFC. But like I say, at the minute there isn't a fight to break down. So what I'll do is I'll tag this up in um, the timestamps and if and when Sadiq Yusuf does get an opponent, I'll just drop a quick uh, pick in the comments. So make sure you check out the comments if Sadiq Yusuf does get a fight. And I'll also change the description. Uh, I'll put in the description of the YouTube video as well who's, who you, Sadiq Yusuf is, is fighting also. So yeah, unfortunately that fight fell through. It was going to be a really good fight in my opinion. And I'll update as and when we know more with Sadiq Yusuf in the co-main event. And in the next fight, this is another fight I'm really disappointed with for the right reasons, really. We've got Chidi and Giacowani versus Gregory Rodriguez. The reason I'm disappointed is because I really like both guys. Both guys, I feel, are at this stage in the career where they're not getting massively favoured in fights. You know, they're not ridiculous minus 400, minus 500 favourites, but they're also really, really solid for the level of fighters that they're fighting. This bubble of fighters that they're in right now, before one, before that bubble bursts and one of them goes all the way up into starting the climbing the rankings, I feel that both of these fighters are just going to be at the top of that bubble, if that makes sense. So these guys are at the top of that, that echelon that's just before they're about to burst into the rankings. And the UFC have done some real good matchmaking here. But like I say, from a selfish perspective, unfortunately, it's a fight that I don't like because like I say, I've cashed on both guys um, quite a lot as well recently, all that pretty decent betting lines as well. But they, at some point, inevitably, the prospects have to meet each other. And it is going to be an interesting fight. Chidi and Giacowani, he's, his kickboxing background it definitely shows inside the cage. He's got deceptive power, straight punches. He's like a sniper. And also, like we saw in his last fight against Todorovic, the elbows in close. It's all typical of a kickboxer that, that works elbows, works knees. And again, that's another good side of Njokowani inside the clinch. He works the knees beautifully. And he'll always seem to find space inside the clinch as well, even if it's all really close in and there's not a lot of space to work. He'll just extend his arm. He'll find that space to be able to land some shots. So inside the clinch on the feet, Chidi and Giacowani is just an absolute monster. On the ground, Chidi and Giacowani is a black belt. Black belts do come in all different shapes and sizes, though admittedly, and we'll talk about that in a minute, but it does tell you that he's very comfortable on the ground and he doesn't panic and he can get back up to his feet. And he's very aware of his skills on the mat as well. He's wrestling offensively doesn't really use it defensively it's decent but he can be taken down and that's where we come to Gregory Rodriguez Gregory Rodriguez national champion in Brazilian jiu-jitsu and a legit black belt and this is I'm not saying Chidi and Jacuan is not a legit black belt but when I said black belts come in different shapes and sizes Gregory Rodriguez's black belt is definitely more apparent than Chidi and Jacuan is and Gregory Rodriguez is a monster on the mat he can switch between sitting hard and heavy on top to then floating lightly to following his opponent's positions as they're trying to escape and get back into a decent position themselves and also blocking them transitions in the process on the feet rodriguez's boxing has got really good as well really good hands he's got good power and both fighters are just extremely well rounded so i do think it's going to be somewhat of a close fight however i am siding on the, well, I am edging on the side of Chidi and Giacowani here for two reasons. The first one, I think that Gregory Rodriguez is that type of jiu-jitsu player that scored a few knockouts, hit a few fighters quite hard, and 
because of that, he's fell in love with his striking and not really getting to his jiu-jitsu as much as he should. But if he does try and get to his jiu-jitsu, he's got to out-wrestle Chidi and Jokowani. And Jokowani can be taken down, but it's not easy to take him down. And if you do take him down, he does a decent job of getting back up to his feet. So I do feel that this is a fight that we might have some moments on the map, but I don't think that the grappling is going to factor too much into how this fight's won and lost, whether that be a finish or whether it go to the scorecards. So I do think the fight's going to be won and lost on the feet. And the thing is with Gregory Rodriguez, he hits hard, sure. Chidi and Jokowani's got to be really careful of that. But Gregory Rodriguez is quite static with his head movement, doesn't move it off the centre line. And I feel because he doesn't move it off the centre line, the straight sniper shots that I've spoken about of Njokowani are going to be there. I think njokowani has got deceptive power. I just think he's a better overall striker from a technical perspective. And like I said, I feel like there's going to be some really close moments in this fight. But when you're looking at if the fight is won and lost on the feet, which I believe it is, who's the better striker? I'd give that edge to Chidi and Jokowani. So for those reasons, I am picking Chidi and Jokowani to win this fight. And in the next fight, we've got Tanner Boza versus Rodrigo Nascimento. Now, in theory, I like Rodrigo Nascimento in regards to a fighter. You know, he's got decent Muay Thai. He's, he's, that typical, he's that typical Brazilian type of fighter that's got the Muay Thai striking, that's got really good jiu-jitsu. And I say typical, I mean, you know, old school typical. That's what a lot of these fighters were that came into the UFC. So I feel that Rodrigo Nascimento has that type of style. I think with Tanner Boza, he can get taken down. Like we see, we saw that with Alia Latifi. And if he is taken down by a good wrestler and he can be sat on top side, he can get a little bit stuck on his back. But having said that, he's not an easy fighter to take down. And you've got to remember that Alia Latifi is not only like a physical specimen of a man in regards to strength, you can see that raw strength. It's not just his big frame, he's genuinely strong and has that physicality about him. But Alia Latifi is a good wrestler as well. And that's important. Because the thing is here with Rodrigo Nascimento, I don't think that he's anything close to the wrestler that Alia Latifi is. So is he going to be able to get Boza down? I think he possibly could. I'd never say never, but it's unlikely. And if he doesn't take Boza down, it's going to be a potential fight that's going to be won and lost, just like I said in the last fight. And I feel that Tanner Boza is forward pressure, his durability, the fact that he really chops at the low kicks as well. And again, that's another point. If Tanner Boza does chop at the low kicks nice and early here, it's going to halt the movement of Nascimento. Nascimento is going to be able to struggle to get much going. The takedowns aren't going to be as there for him. So I feel that Boza is just methodically going to do a better job on the feet than Rodrigo Nascimento. And I do feel that that's where the fight is more than likely going to be lost. If Nascimento does get the fight to the mat and gets Boza out of there or controls him for two out of three rounds because the takedowns are there, then I'm not going to be shocked. I'm just thinking of where it's more likely that the fight is going to be won and lost. I feel like that's going to be on the feet. And I think that Tanner Boza is just going to do a, a better job of breaking Rodrigo Nascimento down and really just getting the edges wherever the fight goes. I think he'll be the one forcing him backwards. I think Nascimento will be game here. I do think he's going to have good moments, but I do think that Tanner Boza is just better as a mixed martial artist very slightly right now. So for those reasons, I'm picking Tanner Boza to win this fight. And in the next fight, we've got Alan Amadovsky versus the newcomer making his UFC debut, Joseph Pfeiffer. Now, Ultimately and unfortunately, I do think this is probably going to be Alan Amadovsky's last fight in the UFC because I don't see him winning this fight. And the problem that Amadovsky's got is he's coming to the UFC actually with a decent record, a decent background. And, you know, he's fought for Bellator and, you know, he's fought a decent level of competition. So suit, being suited into the UFC was a possibility. But the problem that Amadovsky's got is... He, on his debut, he's fought a UFC veteran in Christoph Jocko. Not a veteran that's de old and declining, but he's, he's, fought, he's fought a guy that's been in there with some of the best in the division, and he fell short. You know, you can't, really, you can't really knock him for that. But then he fought a fighter that's on his way out and declining and probably looking at other things or the regional scene in John Phillips, who is no longer with the UFC. John Phillips beat him. And then he's fought a newcomer, an up-and-comer, in Joseph Holmes and unfortunately he fell short against him as well so it feels like Amadovsky he's had that test against the different the different levels and the different styles of different fighters and where they're at in their careers and he's fell short in all of them and I feel like he's going to fall short against here I feel like Pife is probably going to be outside of Jotko the hardest fighter that he's fought in the UFC I think that Pfeiffer 
is a better fighter than Holmes. I think Pfeiffer is a better fighter than John Phillips. Pfeiffer's got real good movement. He's got solid power, forward pressure. He's really big for the division as well, tall, rangy. He's got wrestling. We've seen that. He's got a top game. And I think that Amadovsky, he's the type of fighter that's going to want to come forwards, that's going to want to try and make this a slugfest brawl and try and knock you out. And even if he does that against Pfeiffer, I think Pfeiffer will be able to land something to knock him out. And we've seen Amadovsky hurt. We've seen Amadovsky submitted. We've seen Amadovsky controlled and dominated. So it's real tough to see how Amadovsky actually wins this fight. And the only thing that amadovsky has got going for him is the fact that Pfeiffer is coming into this fight on his UFC debut from the Contender Series. And we have seen from time to time that some of these Contender Series fighters can fall at that first hurdle when you expect them to win when they're in what you believe is a good stylistic matchup. So I do think that Amadovsky has got that on his side, but is that enough to actually be confident even in giving him you know, a decent chance of winning this fight. In my opinion, it's not. Like I said, I think pyfer has got the power, he's got the speed, he's got the, the, the agility, he's got movement, and he's got some wrestling if he needs it as well. So with everything put together, I think it's a tough fight for Amadovsky, and I'm picking Joseph Pfeiffer to win this fight. And in the next fight, this should be a fun one. We've got Andre Feely versus Bill Algio. And it's going to be a fun fight because... Both fighters will be in there and they'll stand, they'll, they'll bang, they'll crack on the feet. And when we're looking at the wrestling and grappling, I, I think that both fighters will probably cancel themselves out here. I think that Feely and Bill Algio have got decent wrestling. I think Feely's the better wrestler. Algio's a real tricky fighter to deal with on the mat, but Feely's not a fish out of water on the mat either. And again, that's another thing to take into consideration. I feel like Algio's probably the more likely fighter to do better in the top positions, but I don't think that he's going to be able to out-wrestle Feely, at least not very easily. I think if Feely does go with the wrestling, I think Feely's offensive wrestling could get Aljo down, but Aljo's BJJ is good enough that I don't think Feely's going to have too much success on top of him, which ultimately leads you back to a fight, again, that's probably going to be won and lost on the feet. And I feel that's where Feely's going to have advantages in this fight because I feel like he's the cleaner fighter. He's the crisper fighter. He does a real good job of switching stances. And I know Bill Aljo does too, but Feely's got a real striking pedigree when it comes to fighting on the feet and he's able to throw good strikes both offensively and he's been he's got a good defensive work in both stances as well which is normally the problem you see with a switch stance fighter the defense is normally a little bit off on one of the stances but feel is really fluid and fluent in both stances so in a fight that i feel like it's going to be won and lost on the feet i think bill aljo is going to have his moments but ultimately He's a little bit of a hands-down type of fighter. He gets hit a little bit too much, and Feely can crack. And like I said, I think the accuracy and the cleanness of the striking is going to really tell the two fighters apart here. If Bill Aljo can get a takedown and get on top of Feely, I think it's one of those fights where I don't think he'll be as successful as like a Bryce Mitchell, for example. But I do think that Aljo could have some real good moments if he takes Feely down. I just feel that the wrestling of Feely is slightly better than... The defensive wrestling of Feely is going to be slightly better than the offensive wrestling of Aljo. And that's if Aljo even uses any wrestling. Normally, the fights that we see with Aljo on the mat is because the fights got there in a different way. And then he starts thriving. He's not really an offensive wrestler type of fighter I think the fight's going to be won and lost on the feet I think Al is going to have his moments it's going to be in your face he'll try and overwhelm Feely he'll walk through strikes he'll walk through some pressure but ultimately I think the clean the cleaner sharper crisper striker is Andre Feely and that should get him over the line so I'm picking Andre Feely to win this fight and in the next fight we've got Trey Ogden versus Daniel Zellhuber and this is Again, an interesting fight because I feel like we've got an absolute striker versus grappler matchup here because Trey Ogden he is a submission grappler, in my opinion. Yes, he's got some stand-up, but ultimately he does his best work on the mat. Plenty of submissions on his record, and you can see he's quite a fluid grappler as well. Daniel Zellhuber, absolutely a striker. I'm not saying that he can't do good work on the mat as well, but prefers to keep the fighters on the feet and really try and light his opponent up. Rangy strikes, strikes straight down the middle. Like I've said, we on Jakawani is very clean, he's crisp, and he's like a sniper with those straight shots. So I think that Trey Ogden is going to try and get this down to the mat. I think Zaluba is going to try and keep this fight standing. Now, I think that Trey Ogden might have some success early in this fight taking Zaluba down. But I think Zelhuber is going to do an okay job of either staying safe or getting back up to his feet. And when they're on their feet, I think Zaluba is going to absolutely light Trey Ogden up to the point where 
he could potentially knock him out, but if he doesn't and he just hurts him and continues to pepper away at him and pick his shots with the accuracy and, like I say, with the striking pedigree that Zell Huber has, I feel like it's going to prevent Trey Ogden from being able to close the distance easily, getting a hold of him, because every time he comes forward, he's likely going to get hit straight down the barrel. And it's just going to really set Trey Ogden back consistently the longer the fight goes on so I think Ogden might have some success early sell Huber's UFC debut make him feel uncomfortable put the pressure on him from the get-go but if Ogden doesn't take Zell Huber out with a submission early and Zell Huber is able to get back up to his feet I think it's going to just be one of those fights where it's going to be a long night for Ogden getting pieced up and picked apart potentially finished at some point but if not you know potentially losing two out of the three rounds so for those reasons I'm picking Daniel Zell Huber to win this fight and in the next fight, we've got Nicholas Mota versus Cameron Van Camp. And Cameron Van Camp coming down in weight is going to be huge here, it seems. He's going to have a, a, a real good range and height advantage over Nicholas Mota, who is quite small for the division as it is. But Nicholas Mota's got a real, real good striking game to, to himself. I feel that his last fight against Jim Miller probably didn't portray his best work. I feel like he probably had an off night there as well, but Mota's good. Like He's got real good speed. His combinations that he puts together, he rips to the body, he rips to the head. He's got power and He's really one of those reactive guys who, with the second that you come into range, he'll just bang, bang, bang and just fire like a barrage of strikes. It'll, it'll halt his opponent's forward pressure. It'll stun them a little bit. And then he'll, they'll potentially stop, move back and allow Motor to come forwards. And I think that that's where he's going to have success in this fight. Cameron Van Camp is more of a grappler. He is He does prefer to be on the mat. He can strike. We saw that in his last fight, but he does look like... He's a fighter that prefers to get the fights down to the mat. And for as long as this fight is standing, I think that Mota, even though he's going to be a little bit smaller, I think he's going to be more agile. I think he's going to be the quicker mover in and out of range, lateral, lateral movement as well. So I think he's got all that on his side against Cameron Van Camp, who's probably going to want to get this fight to the mat straight away, or if not straight away, I think after a few combinations that are landed from Mota, I think Van Camp's definitely going to try and try and force this fight down. But I don't think it's going to be easy to get Motor down. If he does, I think Motor can get back up to his feet and then start putting the, the combinations together again there. I think Cameron Van Camp coming down in weight and how big he is as well, potentially for me, he's going to have some question marks on what the weight cut's going to be like. Is it going to draw a cardio issue during the fight as well? And if it does, you don't want to be having cardio issues against someone like Motor who can go all day. So with all, thing, with all things considered, I think that Cameron Van Camp, if he can get Motor down and can keep him down, then that's where he'll have the most success. But I don't think the likelihood is that probable there. So for those reasons, I'm picking Nicholas Motor to win this fight. And in the next fight, we've got Trevin Giles versus Louis Kosi. And I think that this is one of those fights where my head's telling me that Kos is going to win, but my heart saying Trevin Giles. And the reason being it's, it's that type of split is Trevin Giles is the better fighter. So all round, he's the more experienced fighter. He's been there against better guys. He's a decent striker. He's got a decent wrestling. He's got a good grappling game as well. And from a, an, out, an, an all round type of fighter perspective, he's, he's head and shoulders above where Kos is, in my opinion. But the thing is with Trevin Giles is, You've got trouble trusting him because he does make mistakes, unforced errors. He's also now been knocked out in two in his last two fights against Michael Morales, against Drikas Duplessis. Bear in mind that Morales and Duplessis are decent fighters, you know, so how much you can knock Trevin Giles for that, I'm not too sure, but the fact that he is a little bit untrustworthy, and I've said this in previous fights, and he does make mistakes and unforced errors, and the fact that he's now been knocked out in his last two fights, it's almost... It's very difficult to pick him to win this fight. But then on the other side, you talk about trust. You look at Kosi. Kosi is one of those types of fighters that comes out the block real fast, real hard. Tons of power will try and knock you out. And he might be able to get Trevin Giles out of there very early on in this fight. But if he doesn't and he tires out, Trevin Giles is going to be able to really put it on him because he's got that all-round style. He'll be able to strike against him, be able to wrestle against him. Kosi's got decent wrestling as well, but when you're tired, he's got no wrestling. He'll be able to grapple against a tired Kosi also. So it's one of those fights where Kosi's either going to win this and knock Giles out early in this fight, 
or he's not going to knock Giles out. Giles is going to be able to weather a storm and then could just completely take over the fight therefore after. And like I said, both are very, very possible. It's one of those fights where it's real difficult to pick, but what I have what I normally side towards is the fighter that is the all-round type of fighter, the fighter that if they weather that early storm, that they're more than likely going to win the fight because not many fights at this level of the UFC, or shall I say when, you, when a fighter gets to this level of the UFC, when they've got the power and the, the hard strikes and the combinations, those knockouts can run more dry than what they would on the regional scene. And then the added caveat to this as well is that Kosi has that potential cardio issue if he does overload and completely, you know, drain his gas tank early on. So with that in mind and the fact that I usually side with the fighter that is more well-rounded that will likely win if they weather a storm, I am siding with Trevin Giles and picking him to win this fight. And in the next fight, we've got a potential car crash here. And I mean this in the nicest way, by the way. We've got Damon Jackson versus Pat Sabatini. This fight for me is going to be absolutely wild. I think we're going to see a ton of wrestling, jiu-jitsu. I think we're going to see scrambles. It's going to be chaotic on the mat. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I feel like Pat Sabatini, he's the one with the black belt. He's the one that I think people trust more in regards to the grappling. And I kind of get that, but Sabatini still makes mistakes on the mat. We've seen it. He's still able to be taken down and his opponents can, as long as they've got a decent top game themselves, can keep him down for moments as well. Sabatini doesn't rest on his laurels. He doesn't just lay there and accept position, but he can be controlled on the mat. We've seen it. And the thing is with Damon Jackson, he's not the black belt, but he's beaten black belt. He's beaten Charles Rosa. He's beaten Cam Wallacher. Both of those are black belts. Are they the level of Pat Sabatini, who was a black belt under Daniel Gracie? Likely not, but still, he's, he's fought against good black belts that have got good ground games and controlled them. The problem with Damon Jackson is, just like Pat Sabatini, he can make a lot of unforced errors and mistakes, but I feel that Sabatini makes less unforced errors and mistakes when it comes to the grappling. But both are, are really like, I think they're gonna, we're going to see a, a ton of scrambling, the switching of positions. I think we're going to see submission attempts as well. And when it comes to the wrestling, both fighters have got decent wrestling, you know, good wrestling backgrounds. But both of them can be taken down. Both of them have lower than you'd expect takedown offense, takedown completion percentage rate so this fight's real crazy whichever way you look at it and I think when even when you go to the striking I think that both fighters are low on volume especially Pat Sabatini who throws almost nothing and I think that Damon Jackson's going to be the better striker when it comes to the wrestling I think they're both going to be able to score takedowns I think they're both going to get taken down when it comes to the grappling I think it's going to be chaotic I think Sabatini is probably the slightly better grappler but the fact that Jackson makes everything so mental and chaotic on the mat and is really good at using submissions to either cause a panic or find a, a sweep or reversal I feel that that's going to be advantageous for Jackson as well I think whichever way this fight goes, honestly, it's, it's one of those fights that's real difficult to absolutely pinpoint and nail on to how this fight's going to play out. I think it's going to be mental. I think it's going to be full of entertainment. But I am going to actually side with Damon Jackson here because I do think he's the slightly better striker. I think from a wrestling perspective, he might have the more success. And from a grappling perspective, I think it's going to be very close. So you're looking at the other two edges. And that's given me a slight lean towards Damon Jackson. So I'm picking Damon Jackson to win this fight. And in the next fight, we've got Anthony Hernandez versus Mark andre Barrio. An interesting fight here in, you know, this, this level in the UFC. I think both fighters do a good job. I think Anthony Hernandez in his last fight, real relentless wrestling. And we saw a different side to Anthony Hernandez inside the cage because that, re that wrestling was really relentless. And I think if he comes in here against Barrio with that same relentless wrestling, I think he's going to have some success. But... Mark andre Barrio has got decent takedown defense. It's really tough to take him down. If you do take him down, it's even harder to keep him down. He's got a good get-up game, finds a way to pop back up. And I think Anthony Hernandez rinsing and repeating, rinsing and repeating against somebody like Barrio, who is defending the takedowns, who is making you work. I think that Anthony Hernandez might end up getting a little bit stuck from a cardio perspective. But Anthony Hernandez has got decent strike and he's got good power, but so is Barrio. And the thing is with Barrio, he'll walk. He's normally the pressure fighter, even against other pressure fighters. He's normally the one that still comes out on top in regards to the one that's being allowed to come forwards. 
And Barrio is that type of fighter where he'll constantly just walk forwards, walk forwards, land shots. And like I said, I think that that's the type of fight that Anthony Hernandez is going to come really unstuck against because Anthony Hernandez, his entire game is based on him moving forwards and that allows him to really flourish, take the fight in any way that he wants to take it and just use all the martial arts against his opponents. But when he's forced backwards, he's a completely different fighter. And that's where I think he's going to have trouble. I think Barrio is going to be able to put pressure on him, force him backwards, take away a lot of the tools that uh, Hernandez likes to use from an offensive perspective and then ultimately Barrio is going to be able to flourish more inside the cage so I'm siding with Mark andre Barrio and I'm picking him to win this fight. In the next fight we've got Maria Agapova versus Gillian Robertson and I've been back and forward on this fight initially I leaned Agapova but you know, you look at what happened in the last fight, she was taken down very easily, she was controlled and she was ultimately submitted by Moroz and Moroz is a decent wrestler, she's a decent grappler, but I think that Gillian Robertson, I think she's as good wrestling, I think she's a better grappler than Moroz, so I think the problems that Agapova's had in her last fight, if she's taken down, she's going to have that same problem here as well. And the only thing that I feel like Agapova is going to be able to flourish at some points in this fight is that we've seen Gillian Robertson really struggle for takedowns and struggle to get that offensive wrestling going when she's facing a fighter that's in your face that's landing and trying to bang with you like we saw that against Macy Barber Gillian Robertson had some real issues against Macy Barber from that perspective and I think Agapova is a similar type of fighter where she'll come forward she'll be aggressive and she'll want to knock you out with a barrage of strikes but again, from a stylistic perspective, I just cannot ignore that Gillian Robertson here has got a massive advantage and he's got strengths where we've seen Agapova have real holes in a game. And that matters, in my opinion. So I think that Robertson is going to get the takedowns that she needs. I think she is likely going to get the submission as well. And if she doesn't get the submission, I think she's just going to be able to control Agapova on top and block any sort of defensive transitions from Agapova and just keep the fight on the mat for long periods of time. I think the fight's going to be won and lost with what happens in the grappling. And that is absolutely where Robertson's the better fighter. So I'm picking Gillian Robertson to win this fight. In the next fight, we've got Aspen Ladd versus Sarah McMahon. The concern here for Sarah McMahon is she's 41 years old and, you know, that is some age for a women's bantamweight fighter. However, I actually think that the age is only a number. I know it's that cliche saying, but the age is only a number in mixed martial arts if or unless you actually see physical declines, physical physically see that the fighter is looking worse than the, what, what they've looked in previous fights and throughout the career. And I don't think you can say that about McMahon. I'm not saying that she's any better than what she was three or four years ago, for example. Although a striking, if anything, probably looks a little bit better than it, it did before. But I think that McMahon is, you know, sort of where she has been for quite a while now. And she hasn't got a long, she hasn't got many fights on her record in regards to for how long she's been in the UFC. So the miles on the clock's okay also. I think that with Aspen Lad, she's got two things here. The first thing, is she's going to be dealing with Sarah McMahon, a fighter, a wrestler that she's never dealt with in her career. Like you look at the, her opponents, Aspen Ladd's opponents that she's fought with, the most takedowns completed per 15 minutes. And you're looking at Sajari Eubanks, I think at 1.9 takedowns completed per 15 minutes, which is a low number. And that's because Sajari Eubanks isn't a wrestler, but Eubanks still took her down twice. Sarah McMahon's a fighter that will shoot over four takedowns per fight. She's an Olympic silver medalist in freestyle wrestling. So... That's one side of it. The second side is Aspen Ladd actually does her best work in top position. Now, this is actually where Sarah McMahon's had some real issues where she's been looking great in fights, one round one, round two, and then bang, falls apart round three, gets finished, gets submitted, whatever that is. And that's because she's ended up on her back, right? So Aspen Ladd, if she can get Sarah McMahon on her back, I think that I think the level of where the both at from that top game to versus the bottom game is astronomical. The problem for Aspen Ladd is getting Sarah McMahon on her back because Sarah McMahon's by far the better wrestler. I think Aspen Ladd's got some okay wrestling, but I don't think it's as good as Sarah McMahon's. And I think Aspen Ladd's jiu-jitsu, I like Sarah McMahon's jiu-jitsu. I think on top, she's able to keep good positions. She's not submission over position. If it means her staying there and making a boring fight just to get the control time in and win the round, she'll do that. So the real concern is what Sarah McMahon looks like in the third round or maybe late in the second round. And that's if Aspen Ladd can get on top of her. If Aspen Ladd gets on top of her, she's that type of fight. She posts her up. She does that 
weird screaming while she's throwing strikes, I actually think is quite smart, if I'm being honest, because it makes the referee start thinking. Um, I think if McMahon does get put on her back, I think it's likely going to be game over. But again, the likelihood of McMahon being the wrestler that she is of getting put on her back against Aspen Ladd, who is quite a slow fighter in regards to her striking. So that movement in and out of range isn't going to cause McMahon too many issues, I don't think. If anything, that's only going to allow McMahon to come forward. It's one of those fights where McMahon will likely win two out of three rounds. That third round is the, fact, is the round that she's likely going to lose. But it's that round that she might end up getting finished in, and that's where the problem is. But again, I always side with that fighter that is probably going to be the better fighter over three rounds, especially in the women's bantamweight division. So stylistically, I think the man's got advantages. And I think that, like I said, the ability to win rounds when needed is key. So I'm, I am picking and siding with Sarah McMahon to win this fight. And in the next fight, we've got Tony Gravely versus Javid Basharat. And I really like this fight. Javid Basharat is a real, real prospect, slick striker, doesn't tire, cardio for days, will light up his opponents, ton of volume, straight punches down the middle, won't overexert himself, won't overload with power, good movement, good kicks. He's got a variety of, stri of striking weapons in his arsenal. Tony Gravely on the other side, he's got power in his hand. You know, we've seen that on multiple occasions now in the UFC. So that boxing is not so technical, but man, he's got power. But Tony Gravely's a wrestler. And this is what makes this fight interesting because I feel that Javid Basharat has got to have his defensive wrestling and his defensive jiu-jitsu on point to beat Tony Gravely because Gravely is likely going to get some takedowns in this fight. But the thing is, I feel like Gravely is going to get outpointed to the point on the feet where the takedowns are going to be a little bit rushed. They're going to be a little bit desperate. He is going to be overly searching for him and trying to be relentless, which is great for him because that's how he wins this fight, should he win it. But the thing is, I think that Javid Basharat's got decent takedown defense. We've seen he's got an okay get-up game as well. Tony Gravely doesn't have the most crushing top game, but he's a good wrestler. So it's one of those where he might be taking Javid Basharat down a few times, but then if Basharat starts defending the takedowns, Tony Gravely's forced to stand striking, and I think that's where Basharat's going to really, really light him up, potentially find a finish as well. It's what, it is a close fight because of the, the, style, the, the style versus style clash, because like I say, if Tony Gravely is just successful with his wrestling for three rounds, then I think he's going to beat Basharat without too many issues because he's just going to be constant, consistently taking him down throughout the fight. But we have seen Gravely slow down a little bit. We have seen that Gravely can look a little bit lost when the takedowns aren't exactly going his way. And I do think he's going to get some initially, but then I think Basharat's just going to real, really make the reads, really get his sprawl game going, defend the takedowns, keep the fight striking. And I think the biggest gap in difference in this fight is within that striking discipline. So for those reasons, I'm picking Javid Basharat to win this fight. And in the final breakdown of this podcast, I know it's been a long one, 15 fights we've spoken about, but we do make it to Loma, Look Boon Me versus Denise Gomes. This fight's going to be good. Like, I think the lines are off, by the way. I don't think that Loma, Look Boon Me should be, you know, this wide of, or this big of a favourite. It's not crazy. I think she's like minus 220 or something like that. So I don't think it's... I don't think it's massively off, but I do think it is off nonetheless. The reason why, though, is because Denise Gomes is a good striker. Like, Loma Look Boom Me is not the type of fight that's going to shoot takedowns. So I don't think that's going to be an advantage for Loma Look Boom Me in this fight. She's going to keep the fight standing or at least try to. And the thing is with Denise Gomes is she's got the striking to actually be competitive with Loma Look Boom Me. And Loma Look Boom Me's like Thai boxing, a Thai background is just insane. You know, she's got a ton of fights, Muay Thai fights, and you can really see that inside the cage. And it is for that reason I am, you know, spoiler alert, siding with Loma Look Boom Me to win this fight. But Denise Gomes has got power. She's got that overwhelming pressure where she'll come forwards, land big shots, land kicks, land punches, but she can be got at at times. And we saw that in the last fight. She can be got at at times. And that's where you do feel that Loma Look Boom Me, when you're looking at, at those times, Loma Look Boom Me will fill at those times in, but then Look Boom Me will also do good work around the at those times, if that makes sense as well. So I think that Denise Gomes is going to have good moments in this fight. I think she's going to take a round and probably make another of those three rounds, one other of those three rounds quite close. So we could potentially be looking at Loma Look Boom Me winning one round, Gomes winning another round, and then 
the the third round that we're talking about is probably going to be relatively close, but in a fight that is won and lost on the feet. I do think that Loma Lutbu Me does have that edge and experience. She does have that technical striking quality. She's not going to be dealing with a fighter that's con constantly trying to take her down to the mat. Therefore, she's going to be able to flourish a little bit more from the striking perspective as well. So with those things considered, I think it's going to be a good fight, a close fight in parts. A fight where Gomes is going to have a moment, but I am picking Loma Lutbu Me to win this fight. And that's all for this episode of the podcast for UFC Vegas 60. I apologize that this is a little bit longer than usual, but 15 fights, what can you do? But thanks for tuning in. Thanks for listening. Thanks for subscribing. If you do to the MMA Play 365 YouTube channel, we are trying to hit a thousand subscribers. So if you are listening to this and you haven't subscribed, please just hit that subscribe button. It'll really help us and the channel. And the likes of the videos also really helps the algorithms as well. So I appreciate that. Also, if you do want to comment who you're picking on this card, where you disagree with me, where you agree with me, I'll always try and get back to the comments in the replies as well. So with all that said and done, I'm Newsom. Thanks for listening. We'll see you again next week.